What is the future of ethics and corporate sustainability in retail? Well, that's the question presented for discussion to our panel, led by Bill Bowie. Bill is not only a co-founder of Convedit and the Sustainability Context Group, he was also the lead author of the first Walmart Sustainability Report back in 2007. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Great to be here. Thank you. Your theme was short-termism versus long-termism. What did you guys set out to discuss here or learn? Well, the key exploration that we were looking at was the degree to which a short-term imperative, particularly a financial pressure, either helps or more likely hinders the achievement of sustainability through ethical practices. So it really was looking at the degree to which long-termism or a long-term perspective is necessary to marry ethics, sustainability, and financial profit. And Bill, who did you bring in to have this conversation with? Well, we got a great mix of both third-party experts, such as consultants uh, operating in this field, as well as industry players themselves. So, for example, Bruce Clafter is a vice president of corporate social and environmental responsibility at Flex, as compared to some of the consultants that we brought in, such as Joss Tantrum from Terra Finiti. Now, in your executive summary, disruption seems to be a factor or was a factor of the discussion, right? Yeah, disruption played a key role in a couple of ways that I'll explain in more depth. But just up front here, there was both technological disruption that seems to be a driver that can break through this deadlock of short-termism, but also that that keys into broader cultural disruption as well. And in key point number one, you do go deeper into this uh, disruptive technology, right? Tell us more about that. Yeah, so Bill Roth, one of our ongoing key experts here, really has consistently chimed in on the role of technology in creating a disruptive atmosphere that helps bring ethical and sustainability considerations and practices into the fore. So he was really a main driver behind this particular key point. Bruce Clafter, as I mentioned earlier, from an insider perspective on the corporate front, gave a little bit of reality check to that, pointing out that that kind of dynamism of technological disruption also has to be counterbalanced with the realities of how corporations can ingest that disruption in their long-term planning. And now in key point number two, you do go into investment because some of this obviously is going to require some money, right? Yeah. So the investment and particularly the stock market investment plays a role. David Feidner pointed out that ESG or environmental, social and governance indexes are uh, starting to really, you know, have an influence on where companies that are the recipients of that investment head. Josh Tantrum provided a little bit of counterbalance there, pointing out that the overall structure of capitalism right now and its interpretation in the marketplace as a sort of a short term profit generation machine also has to be taken into account. Wow. Well, that's a lot to a lot to think about there. Key point number three, you talk about the population. It's aging. Some are older, some are younger. How does that affect the conversation? Well, David Feidner, again, kind of pointed to the baby boomer demographic moving into retirement and in particular, the impact of that on investment markets as their pension funds become drivers of corporate practice. And then also Alexandra Sokol pointed out that in addition to the, the baby boomer generation, there's also the millennials who are becoming more of an economic and financial force. And interestingly, from both angles, there's a kind of long-termism that is coming to the fore. Baby boomers starting to look back on their legacy and their grandchildren, millennials looking forward into the kind of world that they will inherit. 
So it's an interesting kind of dynamic of, you know, a, a generational demographics that may be driving in the same direction. It's an interesting place where that overlap does happen and, and you don't see the kind of uh, disjunction between generations. Now, in key point number four, this is the tug of war, right? This is the teeter-totter between government here to protect us and help us and government here to big brother and oppress us and create a bunch of policies and regulations. So talk about this. Yeah, this was, again, Bill Roth uh, introduced this notion really brilliantly by uh, hearkening back to the days of, of automobiles before seat belts. And, you know, for those of us who can remember that time period, it was just unthinkable to put on your seat belt when you got into a car. It was uncomfortable, inconvenient, et cetera. And yet our culture shifted significantly when the data around safety really became internalized. People understood the significance of that data. And we really saw a shift, a sea change, if you will, in terms of broad acceptance of safety measures that were then sort of codified by policy. So what I see emerging here is the notion that, you know, policy can be an invisible enabler that, that, you know, if you set the right policy that gets the right playing field into place, it can be really key to driving robust markets uh, instead of sort of popular conservative meme that policy automatically slows down or, or hampers markets. So it was a very interesting tension in that part of the conversation. How much is uh, culture a factor? I see that coming up in your key point number five. Yeah, I think that this is where, you know, some of the notion of technological disruption can convert into a broader cultural understanding. And this is where Lisa Lauren pushed back a little bit on Bill Roth and the idea that, that it's only technology that's going to make the difference. She believed in disruptive culture as a sustainable path. And Bill, I think he both embraced that, but he also underscored that he believes that in order for sustainability to become a cultural norm, that it has to manage this technological disruption very actively. This in the end falls to ownership, right? Yeah, you know, that's where that's where the control, the money, if you will, the the buck stops here. So the, the there was really a robust conversation around the distinction between private ownership and particularly family ownership and public market ownership on the stock markets and pointing out that, you know, sometimes family owned businesses or privately held businesses such as SC Johnson and Kohler can really have the latitude to set the direction that other businesses end up following. So that part of the, of the conversation was, was particularly interesting in sort of seeing the, the public markets as a driver of change as compared to the, the private markets, if you will. Again, you had a lot of great experts on the board. Which ones really stood out for you? Well, Bill Roth continues to stand out in his ability to frame and articulate issues that take both the big picture into account as well as how that plays out in day-to-day -day reality. So Bill has continued to, to shine on that front. David Feidner played a particularly key role in this theme by really bringing the investment angle into play. And he was the one who surfaced the issue of the long-term perspective from baby boomer pension fund impact. And then finally, Lisa Lauren has again been a consistent high value contributor often by bringing in a counter perspective to the direction that the conversation is headed. So often creating that kind of diversity that a good dialogue really needs so that it isn't just going into groupthink, but rather it's taking a holistic perspective. Well, what a great job you did explaining this conversation to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gene. It's been great to chat about this, and I look forward to the next conversation where we look at the next theme. Bill Bowie.
Bill is not only the co-founder of Convedit and the Sustainability Context Group, he was also the lead author of the first Walmart Sustainability Report back in 2007. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you.